Let's start in Romans chapter 12 at verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God you transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the per- Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think that you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, then be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Changing how we think and learning God's will for us and belonging to each other, all these things we've touched on before, they're all entwined and they are designed to work with each other in harmony for us to present ourselves as a acceptable living sacrifice to God. As we can clearly see in the newest section of Romans 12 here, like I think it's verse 6 through 8 or something, just that last section about the spiritual gifts, Uh, Being a living sacrifice is also intimately related to functioning well within the body of Christ in our designed roles. And in fact, um, just in that natural order of things, we see Paul's first examples of a living sacrifice before. He was just saying, like, these are things that um, living sacrifices look like as far as you have to change the way that you think. You have to you know, give your bodies to God, it has to come from a place of being thankful uh, for all the mercies and blessings that God has given us. All of these things. But this is the first real examples that we see of living sacrifice in Paul's little spiel here. Um, if you notice that not all the gifts are present, uh, that's probably because this isn't like a treatise on spiritual gifts or something like that. But the point is that we strive to master our roles as we belong to each other in God in our effort to be a living sacrifice. So the emphasis there is that on each of those things, he said, do this well, you know? Uh, Obviously, that means, like, the minimum is not good enough. Uh, We're supposed to fully use what we're given. Like, one of the most common things is to look at the parable of the talents, or in the NLT, I think it's called the parable of the three servants, you know, where... Uh, their master is going away, and he gives them each a uh, sack of silver to invest while he's gone. And he gives that to them according to their ability or whatever. So he gives the first servant five bags of silver, and the second servant two bags of silver, and the third servant one bag of silver. And he goes away, and the two with the big bags of silver, they invest it and earn double the money or whatever. And the third guy, he gets scared and buries it in the ground. And when the servant comes back, he rewards the servants for using their money, using his money wisely, what the master has given them, the person with five bags earned five more, the person with two bags earned two more, the person with one bag dug a hole and set it there, and so the master came back and he was mad at the other servant because he just wasted what opportunity he'd been given. And that's the sort of opportunity, that's the sort of um, situation we find ourselves in here with our gifts, that we all are given something specific that we're to use intentfully and to be productive with. Um, So we shouldn't just be looking for the minimum, but use it to its full extent in our pursuit of being a living sacrifice. So let's take a look at Ephesians 4, chapter 11, and expound on some of this concept of spiritual gifts in this way also. 
sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap there between uh, what Paul's saying to the Ephesians and what Paul's saying to the Romans there. But what I want to point out is the idea of um, not just mastering your gift, but at the end there, he says that each gift is supposed to grow to the point and make other parts grow too. So it's not just a functional aspect in the body of, you know, there needs to be somebody doing the dishes and there needs to be somebody, you know, running the school or whatever. But each gift is supposed to contribute to all the other people in a relational sense to where it promotes everybody to grow in their own specific right. And going back to last week, we should be continuously evaluating ourselves, right, to see if those things are true. We can always tell a tree by its fruit, can we not? You might have this big bustling tree in the summertime and it looks really pretty and gives you nice, you know, shade or has nice blossoms or whatever, but at the end of the day, what it matters is its fruit, is what it contributes in that way. And that's how we can tell what kind of a tree it is, whether it's a productive tree or a waste of space. <laughs> so, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we should be honestly evaluating ourselves in that way. And we should point out, though, that there are many ways to grow. Like, the easiest way to grow is, you know, calling out people. Like, some people have a function of, you know, calling out, oh, this is wrong or whatever, you should do that, or you can do these things better, or whatever that is. But a lot of the more submissive gifts, if you have a more gentle gift, don't count yourself out in terms of um, contributing to how other people grow, too, because things are all related to, to each other. Like, for example, um, a teacher's role is to teach, and that is a clear gift that helps people grow. But a person with the gift of service, maybe their role is to support that teacher in all the issues that they're having so that they can fully contribute in the way that they're supposed to, you know, so that you have supporting gifts like holding up the foundation of what's going on so that everybody can make sure um, to grow. Or perhaps a mercy person uh, can see that somebody has a need where um, the teacher or the prophet or somebody doesn't see that yet. And so they can direct a person who has the gift to address that. that they're the ones that are sensitive enough. See what I'm saying? Like all these different gifts have these complex ways of making sure that all the other parts grow. But to be effective, we don't want to just be a flash in the pan kind of thing, like, you know, individual circumstance. We need some heart to it. We need some endurance, right? So in other words, we shouldn't just function well within the body, you know, from time to time or whatever, but we should be dedicated to that standard. After all, like, what, you know, what half-hearted pastor ever led a body to flourish? What unenthused, like, builder ever ever constructed an admirable, like, masterpiece, a revolutionary structure? What dispassionate artist ever inspired anybody, you know? It's like we have to be fully in that and dedicated in order to make a difference over that long term, causing people to grow in a consistent fashion, like Brittany's talking about Oliver. Like, we have to be dedicated and consistent in that effort to make a real difference in what God sees in his plan there. So, yeah, a living sacrifice begins with dedication, you could say. 
because, well, if it's just a sacrifice, it can be a one-time shot, you know? But if it's a living sacrifice, one of the most basic differences between that is the duration of it, right? It's something that keeps going and going and going. Um, without dedication, it's not really a proven holy and pleasing sacrifice to God, right? It's just sort of, it's like how we don't know who's going to be in the invisible eternal church. We know who's in the visible church right now, but without a dedicated and consistent presence through this life, like a person that's in the visible church right now may not end up being in the invisible church. And it's the same way with this living sacrifice, that if you're to be a living sacrifice, it needs to continue throughout that and to really be on it. Um, but a strong dedication means really understanding what sacrifice is, right? So everything we choose implies a sacrifice, right? In other areas, like um, sacrifice can simply be choosing one thing to give as a tribute, situational. Um, you can give money or you can help poor Adam with his dish day on Thursday or Aunt Chris who can't really do dishes right now. Or, you know, you can do these like situational sacrifices things. You can stay up late counseling somebody that needs counseling. But yeah, a living sacrifice begins with that sort of dedication because that's the most basic distinction between a sacrifice and a living sacrifice. Um, you see like the Jews, for example, they were a consistent, um, they were a culture who consistently made sacrifices when they're being good anyway, who made consistent sacrifices um, and they were really dedicated in that. Or, for example, people, like a lot of people, spend like a couple days of the week solidly like feeding the homeless or something like that. Like that is a dedicated and consistent sacrifice. And those things are valuable and good, but as we saw from the Old Testament and just life in general, that that is not what a complete sacrifice, a complete holy and pleasing sacrifice looks to God. It's not just that dedication component. But a living sacrifice is about having a constant pursuit, is it not? Like, the word living, even in, even in the Greek, like, a couple of the aspects of that are that it has vigor to it, it has vitality. It, yeah, is a living thing that pursues what sacrifice needs to be made. You, you see people, um, you hear it all the time, right, where the phrase, that's not living, like, I don't know, somebody sits on their couch in front of the TV all the time, and they're like, you know, they love the show that they're watching, but that's not living. You see the guy who makes a lot of money sitting in a cubicle, like doing finances or whatever, but that's not living. People say, oh, living is jumping out of an airplane, right, Kelsey? Yeah. Or, <laughs> or, or whatever. <laughs> Or, you know, living is, you know, adventuring into the Amazon, or living is, you know, having an active family or whatever. Those are like the world's idea of what living looks like. But the point is that living is not just sustaining your life, right? Living isn't just maintaining the, I don't know what you call that, the status quo or whatever. It's not just keeping things level. Living sacrifice has something more to it. After all, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right? And Christ lived with purpose and vigor, so should we. So, we should be looking for channels to work out that living dedication in our sacrifice. Um, Paul says that we should learn to know God's will for us. He says, Doo -doo -doo. Yeah. Then you will learn... Okay, so... Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We have to learn to discern, to have faith and to test all things, and to figure out what it is that God's will is for us, right, in this circumstance. Um, it includes specific direction and purpose and has that endurance aspect to it, right, that dedication to it. And so we need to tap in 
to that, make sure we're on the same page with God and being in that dedicated role in the direction that he intends for us. But pursuing God's will is a really a, a whole new philosophy versus a sacrifice within your will. So there's two different perspectives here that I'm looking at. You have your will where you live your life and you take pieces of that and you give that as a sacrifice, right? You say, you know, I'm doing all these things. I'm like taking care of my family or whatever, taking care of my needs. And I, you know, I sacrifice Sundays to come to church. I sacrifice 10% of my income. I sacrifice, you know, when the church needs this or that. But that is a different mindset um, than a different philosophy, which is, how we can change the way that we're thinking about that. Um, most people view like recreation as me time, right? Or even the practical stuff, like I was saying, like doing dishes, taking care of your house, like dusting, doing your taxes, like whatever it is. All of those things are things that you have reserved for you because that's what you need to do to survive. That's a philosophy that starts with yourself and you're giving bits of yourself to God and bits of yourself to the government and whatever. Um, but the other way to look at that is that all time is God's time to a person who is a living sacrifice, right? It's like your living sacrifices as a whole, that is you. Paul says at the beginning of the chapter that we're to give our bodies to God. We're to give our whole like self as a living sacrifice. Um, yeah, consider that even like me time is not, is not yours, but in the context that if all of our time is God's time, that me time is a sacrifice on God's part to give that to us. Now, we have a good God, and that's awesome because he wants us to give that sacrifice. He wants to give us a ergo. He wants to give us like... You know, those things that we enjoy. Listen to, you know, Solomon talking about stuff in Ecclesiastes, like to eat and drink and have a good time. Like these are things that are good before God. These are things that he wants us to do. And he's willing to give us that sacrifice. But this is a reciprocal relationship. And we need to, we need to give up our lives to really find it. And so in giving that full life and being in that new philosophy of giving everything to God and then what we take from that is God's sacrifice. That's a whole different mindset, you know? It's like, that's why when something happens, when the roof starts caving in or whatever and you have to do all this stuff, it's not really all that mature to be super sad about that because your plans changed. Like those plans, they were never on your time. Like you live in God's time. You know? So that is the new philosophy that I would propose is being talked about here when it comes to be a living sacrifice. Um, yeah. When we recognize God's will in that day-to-day -day kind of thing, we're to pursue that as part of that vigor and vitality. And specifically here, in this new like couple things in the context of like spiritual gifts and our specific role in the body. Like when we recognize an opportunity to do that, we're to pursue it. It's to be like that's supposed to be our mentality in a living sacrifice to go look for that. Um, in Colossians three, Paul talks about uh, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of as the of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him through God the Father. Like, all these things that we do, it's the same thing. Um, the biblical mandate of, like, loving your brothers and sisters. We're, in this context here, talking about doing that through specifically pursuing how to do that through the role that God has given you. So through your spiritual gift, how can you love your brothers and sisters in that way to build up the body of Christ? In cleaning your house, like we talked about, you know, doing your dishes and dusting and whatever, that is a biblical mandate of hospitality. Um, you can pursue cleaning and aesthetics in that 
in giving that as a sacrifice to God or considering that to be God's time. So in one vein, you're doing it on your own thing and you know holding possession of that. But in the other thing, you're dedicating your time to that because you know that hospitality is something that God values and that that's something that you should therefore pursue in who you're supposed to be before God. And even in your job, you know, Colossians 3, again, talks about working as if you're working for the Lord himself. Um, that supports, like, that drives you to be a good employee. Not for selfish reasons, not being a good employee for money, for position, for respect, not being a good employee for, or sorry, not being um, loving your brothers because of, like, social contract, that you want to be good to them so they'll be good to you, or so that it's not awkward socially or whatever it is. Um, there's different motivations for all those things. And as we're pursuing how to be, how to use God's time, how he wants us to use it as a living sacrifice, that's the kind of perspective flip that we should keep in mind and try to maintain with a duration behind it. Whatever it is, um, our goal is the will of God. Right? So, whatever that is for you, there are, I don't know, let's put it in, the, in a more practical context of like what Pastor Monty likes to talk about. Your goal is the will of God, but you need sub-goals to that, you know? Like, uh, Jacob and James are talking about goals. Uh, your goal, like James's goal isn't to fix the church, it was said. Like, that's a crazy goal, and it's like, it's hard to conceptualize. You know, your goal can't be, oh, the will of God, or my goal can't be, I don't know, to be a good teacher, or whatever it is. Like, those goals are really big, but the way that you pursue things is you make steps to get to there, right? So, yeah, what sub-goals fall in line? Like, how do you make that church Fixed. How do you, you know, come out of the military and now get a stable life? You have to make all sorts of little goals heading up to that. And I would posit to you that in this context of spiritual gifts about figuring out who we are to be in the body of Christ, figuring out how we can pursue the will of God, that it's the same sort of thing with that. Um, and there are are lots of things that we can do for that, right? Our goals can include, like, um, prayer and asking for guidance from God and from other people. We can try out different things to see which things resonate for us, for those of us that haven't, like, really nailed down uh, where our place is in different things. Um, or if we're given a place to do the best by that and see how that works out until, until it's decided, you know, that something else is needed, like just pursuing that actively. Um, yeah, if you're like a teacher, how do you, what do people need to grow? Like, think about those things and make goals as far as how you can be an effective person that will grow the other people in the body. But um, whatever it is should be a living sacrifice pursuing how to customize and adapt in the whole situation. I think of Google Docs. Google Docs is pretty sweet. It's like a live document, you know? It's a living document. It literally changes as you go. People see different things and you can add things to it and it's constantly adapting and pursuing how to be the most accurate document possible. And that is very valuable and that is our God. You know, our God has a specific direction, and we're not always on the same page with that, but we can keep pursuing how to be that adaptable, living, vigorous, um, and enduring sacrifice to that in our everyday lives. So, we should use what God has given us. We should use our talents and our driving motivations to the best of our abilities to inform our living sacrifice and make it in line with God's will for us in the body, causing each part to grow. Yeah. So, let's uh, discuss with a few questions in mind.
uh, how does your fruit make all the other parts of the body grow? And how could it? What are some other ways to look at that? From what perspective do you view your sacrifices? You know, do you view them from this is my thing that I'm like, that I have a hold of and I can dish out this and dish out that and dish out this here and there and be good and do my part? Or do you view those things as not really being yours to start out with and that what you're given is a sacrifice on God's part? Um, or is there some, you know, middle ground or, or alternate thing that you view that from? Like, how does that, how does that match up to what Scripture says we should be in our perspective? And what steps do you intend to take toward working well in your place in the body? Not just the minimum standard, but, you know, pursuing how to be the best that you can in your different roles here. Okay, let's discuss.